Good morning. I know you're all out there. I just can't see you yet. Hello. Let there be light. I'll never forget when we were playing um, what we call Old Zone, because in Saturday mornings there's End Zone, which is all the young kids that play soccer out here and football. And, um, and, and Chuck and the guys over there were gracious enough to loan us adult-sized flag football things about a year and a half ago or so. And we called it Old Zone. It was a 30 and up league. Uh, we, it was just one day, 30 years and up. We let one 20-year-old play with us. That was a mistake. Um, and I'll never forget how funny it felt to me on the side of Old Zone. We're getting ready. We're getting our flags because kids have these flags with like a you know, 20-inch waist. So it's not the same flags you have for dad bod, right? Um, and and, the, and the, the moms were all there. Women, we just said, you know, generally let's be older than 30 because we don't want to be struggling. But we were there before any game had started. And there's a group of us talking in the side about which medication we've already taken <laughs> before the game started. So I'm like, I'm oh, going into this game. It's going to be rough. I'm going to take three Motrins and one guy, knee brace, Percocet. She's got to get it in me, prepare myself for what's going to come. Like, you don't even know was going to come. But it's one of those things, it's like where um, whenever you talk to that old uncle in your family, remember how, you know how they're always the best athlete in the country? Like Uncle, uncle Bob, he was the best athlete. He was all American in every sport. And now Uncle Bob cannot get out of the couch without exhaling and groaning. Um, so that was what Old Zone was like. And there were those moments where, you know, I was running and you feel like you look like Adrian Peterson, like stiff arm, do this. And then you see a video of yourself and it's you running at two and a half miles per hour and the guy with a knee brace and Percocet making gains on you. That's what it really looks like. And, and the difference though is that, is that when you take medication, in order for it to work, if we're talking about a, a medication you have to consume. Now I'm not talking about your eczema. I'm talking about something that you have inside of you. Uh, inflammation is why people take Motrin. Uh, I'm proud to say, if you weren't here last week, I have now been a vegan. I'm on my 13th day of a 30-day trial period, and it's a money-back guarantee um, for veganism. Part of the reason why I wanted to try it is because I read all these things about reducing inflammation. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a great benefit. Let's give up all animal products and joy and see if inflammation goes away as well. And it, it does work, you guys. You can get rid of inflammation and happiness with one fell swoop of becoming a vegan. But, but today, we're, we're going to talk about how you need God not just on you or around you, but you need God in you to be a true follower of Jesus. And John is going to do something. The Apostle John, from verses 7, where we left off last week because we didn't get to get as far as we want, 7 to 11 some of you are going to be like, I don't know if I'm a follower of Jesus at all. I'm just going to let you know now, like, if that's when you have to use the restroom, don't. Because if we get through verse 11, you leave here like, I'm just so sad, I need to use the restroom, I'm not even a Christian, then you walk out, you're not going to get the second half of the message. So, so make sure that you stay for this one, even if you don't like me. Because in the beginning, you might be like, I don't know if I am, and then we're going to come around full circle because John is a pastor who loves us. So let's pray. and We're going to read 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Father, we need you and your presence to consume us, to, to flood our lives, to dominate our decisions, to change our perspectives, to shape and mold our desires from what we used to desire to desiring you. And Lord, today's message will be hard for some people. Because there are so many who come here because it's just the way things are, or because they think that they are right, or because they're following someone else's leadership of their lives and not entering into a relationship with you for themselves. So I pray, God, that you would stir us up, that you would shake us up, that you would loosen the rust around our minds and hearts and souls so that we could see you and be known by you. In Jesus' name, all God's kids said, Verse 7 of 1 John, chapter 2. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness, the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother, is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in 
the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Do you live in the light? Is the light of God in you? The metric used is love. Do you love or do you hate? Now, we need to clarify something because this is a very common phenomenon that I, I run across. When you're talking with friends, let's say you're just out at some restaurant with buddies or bud gals or whatever you call them, and you say, hey, um, blah, 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 you're talking about this. Oh, I love this, I love this. And then somebody will say, oh, man, but I, I hate fill in person, place, or thing. And then you back up, oh, I don't really hate it. I just strongly dislike it. We have this uh, allergic reaction to hatred, and the word hate specifically. But I need to tell you, you can hate something without saying the word hate. To love is to build up. To hate is to tear down. To love is to be patient and kind. To hate is to be lacking in patience and, and rude and evil and breaking. You can hate a lot of things, and just because you backpedal, and I know nobody in this room backpedals from that, right? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Do you have that friend that always does it? Oh, I hate this. Well, I don't really hate it, but you know what I mean? I strongly dislike it. And when they say strongly dislike, they almost say it with more hatred than they said the word hate. Isn't that weird? I don't know. Someone got it with me back here. It's weird. Now, if you have the love of God and the light of God in you, this is what's important. It's important to understand that if God's light is in you, then the love that comes from you will be drawing people toward God. But so many of us are standing here with the ibuprofen, um, or, or like my son, uh, Jackson, who this sermon series is named after, Action Jackson, Walking in God's Grace. Um, he's been having asthma and bronchitis. He's not breathing. He's not here today. You could pray for him. Um, but he's like, if you imagine a, a shorter, more emaciated version of myself, um, when he gets asthma, his muscles get tired. And like you could see him breathing, and you could hear him wheezing. And then we didn't know he had bronchitis. But all of a sudden, you see like his muscles just say, I'm going to give up. And they just stop lifting his chest. And that's when like mom, dad, and by mom, dad, I mean like mom goes full panic mode because uh, she didn't have asthma like I did. I had like the drop on the floor gasping for air asthma. So I'm like, I think he'll live, not in medieval times, but he's good for today. Um, so we get him up, we rush to the doctor, the hospital, and now they've got all these cool machines. When I was a kid, you had to go to the hospital and uh, they hooked you up to the giant nebulizer. Now I've got one that I could just carry around with me, put it in a fanny pack if fanny packs were still a cool thing. And, um, but we put the medicine in this thing, and it's a mask. And you can tell that the medicine is in because it just, it's a, a fog machine. And you breathe in, you breathe out. Here's how the medicine doesn't work. It doesn't work if I just dribble it on his head and baptize him like a Presbyterian. It doesn't work if I put the medicine in the machine and tell him to hold the mask in his hand. It doesn't work if I put the medicine in the machine, put it on his face, but I don't plug it into the wall and hit the on button. You've got to put the medicine in the right spot. You've got to screw the thing on. You've got to make sure the vent is open. You've got to plug it into the wall. You've got to turn it on. And for all of you asthmatic parents, you know the noise. And it drowns out every show that you're ever trying to watch. You can't get a decent episode of Lost in Space in. And then he begins to breathe. And then we got the azithromycin for his bronchitis. And he doesn't swallow pills yet. So it's in a, a tube and it's a syringe, not a needle. Like you just squirt it. And if any of you are like, if you have children, or if you've been a child, you are a child, whatever you are, the bubblegum flavor tastes nothing like bubblegum. It tastes like death and rat poison. And once they cue on to that little secret, it's impossible sometimes to get the medication into kids. I feel bad, but I learned all of my medication giving from the UFC. You put the knee on the throat, hand on the thing, squirt it in, hold their nose. You don't breathe until you swallow. I don't do that. Don't call anybody. But, but it's like that. And, and if, if anybody else has had this experience too, because you go and you pay for that prescription, man, that stuff's expensive sometimes. And you squirt it in and they go, and all I see is just spitting out $100 bills. Like, you ungrateful little, God has been gracious. You've got to take the medicine in in order for it to do what it's supposed to do and work from the inside out. This is what Christianity is. It's an inside-out religion, not an outside-in religion. And there are three reasons, at least, that I was thinking about and meditating on why people can have God in and around and on them. They crush, crush up their ibuprofen of God and put it on them. They have the machine sitting next to them, but they say, no, not for me. Here's three ways that you can do that. First, nostalgia. Many people attend church gatherings because it's what you've always done. 
and you have God stuff around you, but there's no vitality of life in you. There is no genuine love. You can tell these people because they come regularly, they're faithful, they're part of Bible studies, they serve in ministries, and they're also some of the most difficult people to talk to because they're constantly tearing and judging and pulling down rather than lifting and building and loving upward. But people do it out of nostalgia. It's, it's very interesting how it works with families. People grow up in the church, they go in their youth, they kind of turn from God at times, and then out pops a baby. Bling! And what happens when they see that baby? Precious baby. I think you need Jesus. And if they're not sure right when the baby's born, you just wait till the kid goes to preschool and then the teacher sends home a note that says, you know, baby Billy was biting all of the kids. And then you look at that same toddler who's now this big and you say, you need Jesus. So then you bring him here and they bite the kids in the back there. And then I've taught the teachers, here's how you deal with biting kids. They bite a kid, you bite them. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. But, but you... You understand, for some reason, there's this wiring in us when we have a ch child, like, I, I need to make this a decent human being because I've seen so many undecent human beings in the world. So you come back to church. Right? You do it out of nostalgia. It's almost like that feeling when you, when you get in bed right after you've washed the sheets and the comforter on those brisk Florida nights when it's only 89 degrees and you pull the comforter up. That comfort, for some of you, Christianity is only a comfort. And there's no reality to it other than when you need God for something. You go to God when life's falling apart, but when life is okay, you don't need the comforter. That's a nostalgic way to, to approach God and have God on you, around you, and know the doctrines, but maybe not within you. Maybe not. Because it's not bad, but if you make it ultimate, it's, it's bad. The next reason is intellectual pride. Some people are part of church gatherings because they like the intellectual tidiness of Christianity. There are a lot of answers for a lot of questions for which many worldviews do not, I believe, have very good answers. So they come to Christianity and say, I like this. I have an answer for this. This system works here. It fits here. I like this. It's all organized and tidy. But some people come for intellectual, prideful reasons, but they can leave just as easily when another idea that they like more comes along. Because at the end of the day, the God of the Bible, while there is a tidy thing about him and while he, there are answers for many of the difficult questions, if you come just for the answers, you'll, you'll meet a God. And a God will not let you live the way you want to live. So you'll find another worldview that lets you be the God of your own life and gives you answers that are satisfactory enough. Another reason, and this one is, is terrifying for me as a pastor, um, people can pick up Christianity and doctrine around them but not in them because of a particular person, teacher, or leader. You adopt a doctrine because of the strength of their conviction or, or the, the knowledge that they have or the answers that they give, but it's not your own. It's through someone else. And it's not just pastors and teachers and authors and speakers. It's most often, in my experience, I see it done in families. For example, Mother's Day, every year. What would you guess higher or lower attended Sundays of the year? Higher. Father's Day, same question. Lower. You know why? Because mothers, the family's like, hey, it's your day, mom. What do you want? And she's like, I don't want any of you to burn in hell. Come to church. So you all follow her. I need to go. Mom said, it's her day. Flowers, pictures, chocolates, mom, church, Jesus. Father's Day. Dad, it's your day. What are we doing today? Relaxing. Are we going to go to church, Dad? If you want to, then I can relax more. You know, we're laughing. It is across the board in our culture true. Mother's Day, higher attended. Father's Day, lower attended. Which is why on Father's Day, five years ago, whenever it was, I started Bacon Fest in Los Angeles. If you hear it from any other church, you can take all the credit for this because I Googled my brains out. That day of serving bacon on Father's Day started years and years ago in my brain. And now thousands of churches will be doing it. And this church this year, because I'm a vegan, we're doing tofakin. I'm just playing. That's why I'm a 30-day vegan, you guys. But, but, but it's the reason we, we, we bring people in and we say, guys, dads, we want you to love Jesus too. Because I see it all the time. There are one parent or another saying, Jesus, we need Jesus. And here's the thing. Don't walk out of here feeling guilty. Like, wait, am I only here for nostalgic reasons because I was raised in it? That's why I'm here. Am I only here because it's a nice, neat system and it answers a lot of my questions? Am I only here because of a pastor or a spouse or a person or a thing or my kid? Maybe they were born. And I'm like, ah, I need Jesus because I'm a wreck. I need to not be a wreck for this kid before they get teenagers and they're going to be a wreck. Are we here for just those reasons? Or, or is God in us? Because I, I ask people, because I'm a pastor all the time, are your sins forgiven? 
Are you going to be going to the kingdom of God? Are you going to be with God when you die or not with God? And here are some of the most common answers I get. I'm, I'm trying my best. That answer scares me. Or they say, uh, I'm working on it. No. That's not how this Christian thing works. It, it's not I'm working on it. It's not I'm trying my best. And, and don't get me wrong, it's good to work. It's good to try. It's good to exert effort to live a life for God. But that, that is not the thing that's going to give you forgiveness and salvation. And John knows that as we are reading through these verses, he knows some of us are thinking, wait a second, I am in Christ maybe for a wrong reason. I don't have love that exudes from me. I don't have love that overflows from me for others. I'm the person that gets easily offended. I'm the person that easily goes to mocking and judgment. I'm not the loving person. So maybe it's not me. And John, he's so good. He's an old man at this point, specifically an old pastor. So he takes this beautiful tangent in verse 12, and he's, he's going to give us this tangent because his pastoral heart senses that we're going to be wondering if we are in God and God is in us or if we just have God's stuff all around us. So he says this in verse 12, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Why are, why are our sins forgiven? For his name's sake. Now, if, if you were a Jewish person here, you would have just said, amen and amen. But as followers of Jesus, we tend to turn the Bible in so that it's all about us. It's salvation's about me. Forgiveness is for me. But in here, John is saying, children, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Because he cares so much about his name and the way that it's uh, implanted within you and flourishing in this world, that he has forgiven you because his name is his identity. His name is who he is. It's why in this day and age, um, and I wish we did it more now, people named their kids based on what they wanted them to be or based on who they were. If you read through the Bible, you'll find these amazingly weird names like the story of Hosea and Gomer. Gomer's the girl. And, and they have a kid and they name their kid, Not My People. And imagine the daddy issues that kid had. Or, or when Naomi was with Ruth coming back from Moab into Israel, and she said, I'm no longer Naomi. Call me Mara, for I am bitter. There's a lot in the name, and, and your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Verse 13, I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And then he repeats with a slight variation, not I am writing, but I write. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. So because I'm a pastor and this message only has 17 points, we're moving into the four P's of this section. The first is position. You have a position in Christ. Not based on you, but based on his name. Not based on your performance, based on his performance on the cross. Not based on your ability to be good, do good, and obey. Based on Jesus' ability to be good, do good, and obey. And then give that to you because you were such a train wreck you couldn't do it for yourself. You have been. Your sins are forgiven, past tense removed. Yet, so many people have this uncertainty about it. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know. And every time you think, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I've believed in Christ. I love Jesus. I'm just not sure. I'm not, I don't know what's going on. Those doubts, don't feel beat up for having those doubts. Everyone that I've met has these types of doubts. It's the way you approach them. If you approach that doubt and say, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saved. This is, what if I haven't? Here's the... If it's all about you and how good you are, then you are not saved. Just crystal clear, end of story. If it's about how good you are, it's not. You haven't made it. You're short. You won't ever reach the bar. If it's about the fact that you're not good at all, and you've reached out to God and said, I have nothing I need to be saved. That's all it is. One of my favorite songs, um, it's not one you can download or buy because one of my friends wrote it and sang it, the lyric says, I give you nothing, and you give me everything. We go to God with empty hands, broken and stained, and God says, come under the covering of Christ, my son. 
and you are welcomed in forever because of my name, who I am, not who you are, who I am, will make this come to pass. Think of it like a light switch. Repentance, asking for forgiveness, is flipping the switch. But that switch does nothing if there's no electricity. You have to have electricity coming to that switch so that when you flip it, the electricity goes and whatever it's powering goes off. Repent. Click. Forgiveness, love, adoption, brought into God's family, power to overcome sin floods through our lives. And that leads us to the second one. Because the children, you, get, you need to understand your position before God has to do with God and it's not up to your ability. You will never be smart enough. You will never be emotionally attuned enough. But then the power, the young men of God, everyone, all the young men say, Oorah. There's all three of you that would easily get defeated in an army. Oorah. Did you hear that? That's like a hipster's oorah. That was like a seminal heights oorah of coffee drinkers and tight jean wearing people. Oorah. Anyway, uh, power. Young men, you have the strength of God, the end of verse 14, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. I am. Um, isn't it weird here, you guys, Floridian people and just people who have moved here from other places, all of us, how when you drive into a neighborhood, all of the oak trees are the same size? because they planted them like with the community. Isn't it? it's, it's so fascinating to me that there's just not a ton of old trees. If you drive out into the country, there's some old trees, but every neighborhood here has a name. You drive into this neighborhood, so a trace, whatever, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And all the trees right now are like 15-year-old trees. And then there's this one tree in my neighborhood. It's just a monster of an oak tree. And they're all oak trees. They're all out there right now breeding and plotting against my allergies. And... Um, and these trees, in my neighbor, they're all 15-year-old trees, taller than me, it's just way taller. And then there's this giant, uh, it's probably 100,000 years old, and I don't know what I'm talking about, but it's huge. There's a hole in it where creatures live, and my son puts his hand down. Um, it goes up so high, I couldn't climb it if I tried, and I'm half Asian, I'm built to climb things like that. Um, it's just huge. And then, every once in a while, and I don't know how this happens, but my, ac my oak tree in front of my house gets acorns. And I don't mean like five acorns. I never had trees growing up. I grew up in like apartment complexes with trees that didn't do leaves because of landscape costs. But these acorns, they come like the flood of Noah. I mean, they just cover the ground. You can't check your mail without it being a life or death situation for your feet if you don't have shoes on. It's just dangerous. And then because I mow my lawn so infrequently in the, the winter, these acorns, they just they go down there. And they pop up little oak trees. And then literally, there will be dozens of oak trees growing in the front of my house. They're this big. My kids go outside and they just start pulling them up like Thor. I'm like, you're killing an oak tree. You are strong. Because I've told them their whole lives, oak trees are strong. And I use that as an illustration with my kids. Oak trees are strong. Oak trees are strong. And now all of a sudden, they're like, see who's strong now? Oak tree. Goo, goo, goo. I'm like, yeah, go try that with the big 100,000-year-old oak tree at the park. Is the tree in front of my house an oak tree? 100%. Answer yes or no. If you don't know, you don't know. Those of you who have been to my house, if you were the person that assaulted my mailbox three times when I moved here, is that an oak tree? Yes. Now I know who assaulted my mailbox, you thieves. Uh, the oak tree in my park is an oak tree. It's 100% an oak tree. It's not, it's not more DNA of an oak tree than the one in front of my house, nor is it more than the little one in there. But here's where we struggle we don't understand and we don't operate in the power of God within us. The first is position, but young men, we have the power of God. Young women, the power of God, you are strong. You are strong because of the word of God within you. And the word of God in the Bible can be um, used in different phrases. In Ephesians 5, it says, filled with the spirit. And it refers to the same things, that we will encourage each other, that we will teach, that we will make melody with our heart. We will love God. We will be generous. And that's filled with the Spirit. In Colossians 3.16, it says filled with the Word of Christ. And it says the exact same things almost. You're going to sing to each other. You're going to be giving and generous and kind. This idea that right now you have, you have the power of God within you that spoke something where there was nothing. You have the power of God in you that, that when Jesus walked around and when there was a blind person, he said, you were blind, now see. That when Jesus was going on to the storm, he said, waves, shut your mouth. 
and the waves calm down. You have Jesus, the power of God that walked with Jesus, that raised him from the dead, the power of God that gave Samson the strength to defeat the armies, the power of God that was with David when he slayed the giant, the power of God that was parting the Red Sea and causing the plagues. That same eternal, cosmic, divine, unmatchable power lives in you to overcome the strongholds and the addictions and the sin. It's in you already. And it might be this little tiny seed, but it's the seed nonetheless. And there is nothing, there is nothing in your life that is more powerful than the power of God in you. That was the most docile amen I've ever heard in my life. I'm going to amen myself because I need this. Because I get discouraged. Hey, you can amen me needing it. I get discouraged. I get defeated. I get dejected. And every time that happens, it's me forgetting whose word abides in me. That the seed, the 100% amount of spiritual DNA, God has said, I've given it all to you. Now live in it. Don't trust these false punk things in your life that are going to rob you of the power I've put in you. Let that grow. Let the seed grow. Now if you're here and you're like, wait a second. I don't know that I have been forgiven of my sins. I don't know if I'm in that position. Or I don't know if I have that kind of power. Because I, I hear it all the time. I hear people saying, well, you don't know my situation. I mean, I get that God's powerful. But have you met my wife? I get it. Some of our wives, they have the intellect of Bruce Banner and the physique of Thor. Some of our wives have the temper uh, of just a, a massive hurricane ripping through the ocean. Or husbands. Some of you are like, you don't get my addiction. I can't go a day without turning to this thing, this, this alcohol, this whatever, this thing just to numb myself. Is God powerful enough for that? Yes. I've watched God. I've watched him with my own eyes take people who I thought, man, their life is jacked up. And if you've been here any amount of time, you know that I don't get to that place easy. Like, you have to really have imploded your life. If you ever hear me say that to you, like, your life is jacked up, know that on a scale of 1 to 100, uh, that's pretty messed up. Like, if I tell you your life is jacked up, you need to start praying and fasting that day. Because I've seen such a, abysmal and broken things. And God says, oh, you think they're beyond my help? Because it's, I mean, I'm the power. The power of Jesus to walk next to a little girl who had just died. People are wailing and crying. And he says, little girl, get up. I don't even understand how you speak to somebody whose heart is not pumping blood into their brain that gets out to their ears so that they can hear. How do you do that? That is the power of God coming from Jesus' mouth to that little girl's ears. And God says, you know that power? I put it in you so that when you think you're jacked up, messed up, doubting too much, or you think you can't forgive yourself, the power of of my presence is within you to overcome those strongholds. It's not you, it's him. It's not called the armor of whatever your name is, it's the armor of God that is upon you. If, it, if all of this is about you, if you put yourself in the position where say, you're saying, I can't be good enough, I'm not good enough, then you're not gonna ever be good enough. You're, you're right. If it's all about you, I'm gonna power my th way through this. I can figure this out on my own without God. No, you won't, you will fail. The next P is the one that is directing toward the Father's. And that is person, position, power, and person. Christianity is not a set of ideas only. It's a lot of great ideas, but it's a person. Have you ever wondered why it's so amazing to be hugged? Like, super amazing to be... Okay, have you ever wondered why when you first date someone, you talk to them, hey girl, and then you watch something on the TV, and we all did the same thing, right? Their hand's here, your hand's here, and you're just like, do 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 Ding! And it's so weird. The first time you held someone's hand when you're like that young puppy love, it's just like Niagara Falls of sweat are pouring out of your hands. And you're thinking, I wonder if she knows that my hands are sweating. And she's thinking, my hand is drowning in a puddle of his anxiety and insecurity. But, and then you get to know each other. And then that first hug, hugs are the best. Like you can just hug someone. And, and my joke is that I'm, I'm so tall when I hug people, I generally, because I'm a Christian, we're taught to do these weird side hug things that are awkward. No one else does them. But it's also weird because I'm six foot six. So when I hug somebody, um, it's just the, their natural tendency that they lay their head on my chest. <laughs> and it's weird when like a 50-year-old guy like gives you a hug and you hug him and say, man, I love you, bro. And he goes, love you too. <laughs> and I'm like, 
Okay, Uncle Creepy. What a, I mean, this isn't creepy. No, I need to, but there's, there's something powerful in a hug. There's something powerful in a personal connection. God himself is a personal, relational being. He's created us to be relational beings, which is why all of the studies that, that are mentioned in sermons, because it's such a great illustration, are psychological practices. They've done studies where they don't give babies physical touch, and then they give babies physical touch. The ones with no physical touch begin to deteriorate health-wise because we need the connection of humanity. And God is no different from us. It's not an idea that we just come to and say, yes, I like these ideas. They are clean and tidy. I will embrace them wholeheartedly. No, there's a person. And sometimes that person will say, what you're doing is breaking down your life. You need to come out of this. I've given you the power. I've put you in the right position. Now let's go. You're free. You're clean. You're a saint. Come on. I got the seed in you. Let that, the seed's going to grow. But it's a person. It's, it's that connection of, I can, I can go to my wife and say, Amy, I think you do a swell job with our family. I don't know why I'm using my Obama voice right now. And you can, I can just say it's sterile. And you guys are like, yeah, that's, you should probably tell your wife that she does a great job. Or I could do this way where like at night, um, this baby that's in her is there. And she's like, ooh, I think I feel Bella's hand. I think her hands are here. She's, she's punching my side of my stomach. And I, I can lean over and spoon my wife and I say, hey, Bella, what's up? Knuckles. Ba -da 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 -da. I say, babe, I love you so much. I mean, it's incredible that you're this many months pregnant and half the time I come home, you're like on the floor cleaning that up. It's just incredible that you can manage our kids with all the craziness that they are. It's incredible that no matter what's going on in her house, you just have things under control. And I could do it while giving Bella fist bumps, spooning my wife with that giant pregnancy body pillow all around all of us. Now, which one is more personal? Obviously that one. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't like physical touch. You were, you've actually been nurtured that bad direction. You, you've, you have to be trained to not like physical touch. Someone is usually has hurt you in your past or isolated you, so you only feel comfortable by yourself. But we are wired to be in a personal relationship, and it's the same with God. Fathers know this. Mothers know this. And then, the one that's not in the verse explicitly, children, young men, fathers, children, young women, mothers, it's not in there specifically, but it, if you look at the whole tangent that John takes, he wants to remind the people that might be discouraged that their salvation is not real, that this thing is a process. That it doesn't start full grown. It starts with new birth. Next week, um, one of the guys who he came to know Jesus last summer here, uh, he's, we're going to baptize him. I'm going to take these chairs out, and we're, I just want to baptize him right there. If you have been walking with Jesus want to get baptized, you just sh shoot me a text message. My number's in the bulletin. Say, I want to get baptized. I've never done it. And we'll talk about it, and we will baptize you. Because it's new birth. You're born again. What happens is you don't get born again and then you pop out a fully mature, amazing follower of Jesus. That's not how it works in real life. Nobody pops out of the womb and says, Hi, Mom and Dad, how are you? My IQ is 175. You pop out of the womb and you literally scream at your parents and the nurse and then you poop yourself. Take that metaphor, put it right where a new believer is. They're going to pop out of the water and you might see them making a huge mistake in the parking lot on the way out of here. You're like, hey, didn't that guy just get baptized? He shouldn't flip me off for cutting him off. Maybe he should. Maybe he shouldn't cut people off. Jerk. <laughs> don't flip anybody off. That's why I don't give you bumper stickers. You're not responsible drivers, people. If you want a church bumper sticker and you want to be road ragey, I'll get you one from another church. <laughs> it's a process. There's children, there's young, there's old. As a young child, you must know if you're new in the faith, you've got to know what is my position before Christ? Loved, secured, accepted, not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done for me on the cross. As you grow, you get strong, you get nurtured, and there's always somebody that's going to be ahead of you on the curve, and that is okay. As a pastor, people say things to me often. I'm like, hey, would you be interested in leading this group? Would you mentor this person? They say, well, I don't know if I have the knowledge. You know, I just wish that I knew as much of the Bible that, that you know or had the answers that you have. And I tell people all the time, there's always somebody with more answers. I've been nerding out on this book for a long time, but I'll never forget how humbled I was 
when I met somebody who was a missionary or a Native African come over to talk about his journey and his story. And at the time, he was around my age, a little bit older, and he was blind. Blind is a dark room. And we were talking, and uh, his person tells us, yeah, yeah, he's memorized the entire New Testament. Excuse me? I feel a challenge coming on here. Blind guy memorizing a New Testament. So I was my obnoxious self, because I was like the Bible. I knew answers. I could tell you what John 3.16 says. Some of you could do that. How many of you can tell me what John 3.15 says? Gotcha. But this guy, I was like, so what happens in Mark 4 after Jesus calms a storm and tells them they're of little faith, and then he just picked it up. But up, but up, but up, but up. I was like, oh, you are blind. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Captain Obvious, in his African accent. Very nice. That's my interpretation. And I'm like, okay, what happens in Romans 8 after there is no condemnation in Christ? And he just went, but up, but up, but up, but up. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Because he didn't know the verse numbers. He just had somebody because he was blind. And because, and only a few years older than I stand today, blind had someone reading him the Bible because he couldn't read it for himself and he wanted to commit it to memory. So people are like, why? Well, I don't know if I know enough to lead a small group. Well, compared to that guy? I don't know enough to wake up in the morning because he's a blind person and my brain works differently. I'm more of the Homer Simpson brain. I squeeze things in, but at a certain point, now when I squeeze something in, it squeezes something out the other side. So I'm upping my ginkgo biloba. I'm doing veganism. I'm eating brain berries. I'm just trying to get it all. No, but I can't. It's, I'm not there yet. I hope that I can memorize large chunks. I think it'd be cool just to walk around and be like, Romans chapter 1. But to be able to just swing into it, it's a process. Some of you are at the phase where you're like, I just need to learn how to be kind to people. Yes, that's a good thing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Some of you are at the phase where you've grown up a little bit and you're like, wow, not only am I I'm kind to people here and to their face, but man, I just gossip all the time. That's the problem. Let's grow up. Let's get partner with somebody. Grow together. And then some of you are at the phase where you're like, if someone looked at my life, nobody would really be able to identify an outward sin because I've brought all of my sin, what I call bringing it in-house. It's all these things that you can hide, and as long as you can get away with it just enough, no one's going to judge you. No one's going to think less of you. You'll be an upstanding woman or man, but you know it's there. And you could either choose to hide or to, to grow out of that and to confess and to see God's power continue to grow you from one degree of faith to another to another, one degree of trust to another to another, one degree of God being the center and dominating love force in your life from one degree to another to another to another. And you will have setbacks. It will be difficult. But trust the process as you lean on the position that God has given you in Christ. Remember the power next time you're thinking, I can't overcome, I cannot win, I cannot conquer, I cannot be freed. Remember the power that's within you. Remember the person that gave you the position and fills you with that power and is carrying you through the process. If you're not growing in those ways, then definitely go back to the first part of this message and, and ask yourself the question, am I just here because of nostalgia, because of the way I was brought up? Am I just here because it was a neat system for me? Am I just here because I'm following someone else, a pastor, a leader, an author, my spouse, doing it for my kids, whatever the reason, and do some self-examination? Let's pray. Father, you are good and your love endures forever. I pray that the darkness will be lifted. As you have said in this passage, that, that true light is already shining. Help us to press into you. Help us to fight for relationship with you. Help us to move from one degree of faith and trust to the next. And help us, God, to be open and honest with others as we do it. Lord, the last thing we need in, in a church family or people who are pretending. So help us to be family today. In Jesus' name, amen.